Hi, everybody, and welcome back to Ravenheart Renditions. We're talking with Hendrik Varyu again. How you been, Hendrik? Good. How are you, Andrew? Good. Um, finally, happy to finally be back recording again. Uh, it's it's good to be talking with you. It's been a little while on this end. <laughs> yeah, well, I know we've both been busy, and uh, life just kind of passes you by sometimes, eh? Yeah, every, every now and then we... Uh, um, some of some of my end was was uh, actually most of my end was good. There there's been a few things family wise that we we had some stuff go on that we had to deal with. But other than that, I mean, I uh, there was a vacation that was scheduled in there. I got to take my wife, but I've I've switched jobs again. I've changed the way I schedules everything else. So yeah, it's it's been a little crazy to try to get back to this. But we're gonna we're gonna hit her hard and and try to go back to the way things were with the podcast again. So I'm glad to have you back, man. <laughs> good, good. But you, yeah, well, you've been a little busy doing stuff too. <laughs> yeah, I've had. A, well, I mean, uh, I spent a couple, almost a couple of weeks down in Houston recently, mm-hmm. and um, you know that's something I've done for years now. I have some regular customers down there that I, um, they'll fly me down there to help them out in their shops. You know, help them help them design furniture or um, fine tune some machinery. You know, one of them had bought a new. Uh, a new jointer and a new planer, and uh, um, yeah, they, you know these are regular customers that fly me down and spend uh, a few days in in a couple of different shops. Or one year I went to three different shops, and uh, it's it's busy. You know, ten hours a day for for ten twelve days straight without uh, without any breaks, even on the weekends. So oh wow, it's a pretty heavy schedule. You know, I get back. Uh, kind of needing a vacation for sure <laughs> yeah i i wish i could spend that much time in my shop right now i think i've spent 10 hours in maybe the last three months <laughs> <laughs> yeah i mean it, it's it's hard when you're uh i mean you know i do it for a living but i i teach a lot of people that do it as a hobby so i mm-hmm. i kind of understand the struggles that that hobbyists go through trying to keep some traction on it and especially in the summertime you know yeah, the summertime seems to be the 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 draw of everything else. Is like, well, the family wants to this, or the, you know, this event's going on, or that event's going on. So it kind of keeps a lot of people out of the shop in the summer, actually. And and uh, up up around here, I know a lot of a lot of shops are are, are garage or outdoor shops, and you know the 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 bitter cold of winter sometimes keeps uh keeps us Wisconsinites out of some of those outdoor shops and then the humidity of summer so spring and fall is perfect in Wisconsin for outdoor stuff <laughs> yeah yeah i find a lot of people up here in ontario um you know they either have a basement shop in their house or they have usually a somewhat insulated uh garage or something like that Mm-hmm. So I find more of them do woodworking, you know, spring and fall too. But even through the winter, they they might skip the one or two coldest months. Yeah. <laughs> but you know, once once the flowers start blooming and they got to start cutting lawns, visiting cottages, and going on vacation in the summer, you know, pretty much uh, a lot of their woodworking just takes a back seat till September. Oh yeah, yeah. It's uh, the one, moving my shop downstairs and and having air conditioning and heating for it was one of the best things I ever did. <laughs> yeah. I mean, my shop is, uh, well, I don't know if you understand Celsius, but right now it's about, uh, even in the hottest weather right now, it's 22 Celsius, which is probably something like 74. Yeah. So it's pretty comfy, but outside right now it's easily uh, 100 Fahrenheit for sure, maybe more, plus massive humidity right now. Yeah, that's, it, it seem, seems the the ex- the extreme north and the extreme south have the, that humid part to it when the you know the, the air touches you <laughs> and it's actually the humid part it's it's not easy on on wood <laughs> no no I mean I w- when I was down in Houston um, you know it was humid there too but not like here like here it's, it seems way worse mm-hmm. um, but but I had to go down with one of my customers down to a lumber yard there to uh, pick out some wenge and some mahogany. And we drove into this, uh, you know, big giant warehouse and the nice air-conditioned pickup truck. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and I kind of looked at each other wondering who's going to get out first. <laughs> because, I mean, you're in this sort of dark uh, warehouse. There's no 
air circulation in the back corner there at all. <laughs> and we, we get out, and I'm not kidding, within five minutes, my, my shirt looks like I just ran a marathon. I'm like having <laughs> another shower. <laughs> and, you know, like we're looking at a cutting list, and I'm, I'm trying to teach him how to select lumber properly and how to look for defects that... You know, at the same time, I'm like, get me out of here. <laughs> can't stand it. So just sort of rush through it as quick as we could, you know. Just just grab that one. It'll work. I'll tell you later. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And on top of it, like, we were dealing with eight-quarter wenge. Oh, jeez. And some, some of the boards were, like, actually, one of the ones we bought was about 16 inches wide. Oh, jeez. And about, uh, oh, maybe 11 feet long. So that one board was probably... A good hundred to hundred and twenty pounds for one piece. Oh yeah, easy. So, and Wenge has kind of a coarse grain structure to begin with, so <laughs> it can be a bit difficult to identify some, um, you know, cracks in the wood, or you might have some honeycomb checks or shakes. Mm -hmm. And actually, the reason we went there is because he had already bought a Wenge board and didn't realize that it had these cracks running diagonally through the entire board. Like, it would have been useless. Oh. So I said, well, let's take this back. Clearly, clearly they're going to take it back. It's, like, totally defective, and we're going to buy more anyway, so hopefully they uh, they won't give us any trouble. And, you know, they were fine with it. But cool. for, for a hobbyist, a begin, you know, a relative beginner, standing in a boiling hot warehouse with kind of dim lighting <laughs> ticking yeah. out wenge. Yeah. I mean, it's a tough job, you know? <laughs> it's it's pretty wood, but like you said, it's kind of that coarse, and it's it's so dense to, you know, another wood of, you know, a different species of the same size, I think it would be a lot lighter. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. It's beautiful stuff. I Actually, it has kind of a nice uh, brown and black kind of yep. veining in it. Yeah. And often after finishing it with an oil-based finish, you know, it just looks really black. And I, I sometimes think, you yeah, know, maybe I should, like if it's just a, maybe you make a custom drawer pull or something out of it. Mm -hmm. You know, sometimes I think, oh, maybe I should just put wax on it and nothing else because... To bring out the other you, colors, you, yeah. Yeah, you kind of lose the, the two different colors when you when you put the finish on. It's just dark. No, gosh, I, I know I've built a couple of things with Wenge. I don't, I don't think I've ever done a full project with it, but, you know, different accents in it. Does does the brown... You know, there's different woods like, um, like Babinga is one color, but it'll turn... As time goes on, it'll turn to more of a brown than that right. orangish kind of hue that it has. Does does Wenge stay? Does the lighter and the darker stay? Do you know? Yeah, well, it does. But um, like I said, I find that once you put any finish on, I mean, water base might be different. I don't use water base very often. Mm -hmm. but I, I suspect if I put water base on, it would keep more of the brown tone as well. Okay. But with anything like varnish or Danish oil or... Um, you know, any oil-based product, it pretty much all turns dark, but it, it does stay very dark. It's not like it lightens over time. Okay. <clears throat> you know, whereas walnut uh, starts very chocolate brown and dark, but it actually gets lighter with age, and some people don't realize that. Mm -hmm. Kind of disappointed if they wanted a really dark wood. Yeah, well, and that's like some of the some of the exotics. You know, you have that, that really bright, um, like purple heart, you know, you got that purple yeah. color, and and I'm thinking of, I think it's Bobinga that's almost like an orange, um, or is that a red? I can't remember which one's which off the top of my head, but you know, and, yeah. and over time, both of them don't keep that color, especially if there's sun involved. And I'm like, well, I wanted a purple. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I know. I I have a purple heart picture frame in our uh, dining room, and it it actually is still quite purple. Mm -hmm. Um, and it just has a like a Danish oil finish on it, but it, it's a fairly, you know, dark room with um, like a shade so that we don't get super bright light on the furniture in that room. Sure. But uh, but yeah, I know a lot of people complain because the purple heart is so nice and bright, almost like magenta when mm -hmm. they when they cut it. But then after a while, it starts to turn into more of a, a rust brown, like a rusty. Yep burgundy brown and, and they're kind of disappointed because they wanted that purple tone yeah and in the sun i mean we <clears throat> excuse me we uh we built a <laughs> it's kind of funny i just it's the uh, exhibiting the power of the sun we had we built a mosquito trap and basically you, you, you cut the top off of a two liter bottle and you tip it upside down to make it like a funnel and okay. you're supposed to mix uh brown sugar and water and yeast and yeast will produce the carbon dioxide that it attracts the mosquitoes and then um, you 
wrap it in like a dark colored something because mm-hmm. the dark colors and the and the, the CO2 is what's supposed to attract them. Okay. Um, first off, it, it didn't work at all. And uh, <laughs> but we had it setting on the table, which is in the sun, and mm-hmm. that black construction paper within a week is light gray. Yeah. Oh yeah. Mm-hmm. I'm like, holy cow! The power of the sun is nuts because of that. It just what it did to that. I can just imagine the you know what it's doing to the finish on that bench out there. I got to get another coat on there. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's because of a dye, right? Like like aniline dye too in wood is pretty much like the dye you have in a t-shirt or in clothing mm-hmm. and same thing if you put a black t-shirt out on your clothesline and hung it there for for a week in this kind of heat and sun like oh, yeah. it, it would totally lose its color yeah it's it, it's kind of i mean if anybody has a chance to do just something so simple like that you're like wow okay the sun really is wicked because you that same piece of oh, yeah. paper sitting in the house would be black for you know years <laughs> <laughs> yeah. like one, one of my friends uh he lives only 20 minutes away from me uh, he's a good friend from way back, going back to high school days, and he uh, he refinished his whole deck last year, mm-hmm. and uh, you know just went to Home Depot or somewhere and got some advice on some some product and water based product he bought, and he coated the whole thing, tons of work, you know, sanded the old finish and power washed it, and he did the whole deck and the railings and the spindles and everything else. And then uh, by this spring, like, the whole finish is peeling right off already. <laughs> oh, wow. So he's asking me, you know, what should I do? And I, I said, well, my deck's, um, my deck's right now probably 25 years old, and it's pressure-treated lumber. I've never put anything on it. I've never put any, uh, you know, not even Thompson's water seal, nothing. And it's just gray, <laughs> but it's not rotted. Yeah. And I say, you know, you got to learn to like the color gray, <laughs> and you got to just sometimes leave it alone because, you know, who has the time to refinish the entire deck once every every summer or two? Yeah. But up here, you know, we get wicked hot summers and crazy cold winters too, and then you got sun and rain and snow, and so yeah, and almost all, nothing lasts. Yeah, yeah. All, all the extremes that you could have, other than you know actual desert conditions, I and mean, we we get the same thing around here. And I mean, I've got a, a I built a, a a swing, a swing bench for my wife a few years ago, and I I put spar varnish on it. And uh, although I wish I would have bought a little different finish than I have, but you know, other than a couple places that didn't really absorb the finish quite as much as is is probably my application more than more than anything. But other than that, it's it's holding up. Every two three years, I put a another coat of spar varnish on, and we're good to go. <laughs> yep. Yeah, I've got a, uh, like my business sign mm-hmm. out, out front says Passion for Wood, and it's made of mahogany. And, um, yeah, same thing. As long as I don't get too lazy, maybe every second year, just give it a little scuff sanding and put one more coat on, it'll it'll hold up. Mm-hmm. But you know how it is. You get kind of lazy. Oh, it should be good for one more year. <laughs> Next thing you know, it's like four years, and now it's starting to peel off in sheets, right? So, yeah. <laughs> you know, spar, spar varnish is something that looks amazing when you maintain it, but if, you, if you're hoping to just put it on once and never touch it for five years or more, like, it's just not going to happen. Yeah, so, that won't. That not, you know, it's not a big deal for me to refinish something small like a sign, but the idea of doing that on some big, huge, uh, you know, garden thing or like a, like a gazebo or deck yeah. or whatever, it just doesn't interest me at all. No, the, uh, the, the bench I do is bad enough. Uh, it's, you know, you got to get underneath and the back and the sides and everything else. And you're like, Oh man, why did I build this again? <laughs> <laughs> but then yeah, after I, mean, that, I don't have to worry about it for two years. <laughs> yeah, I mean, if you think about it, it must be just a multi-billion dollar industry. Yeah. People just, just constantly recoding things every two, three years over and over. And, and, and then I, I just, I just tell people buy, buy wood that isn't going to rot like cedar or, or uh, tamarack or there's other even even white oak if you're looking for hardwood mm-hmm. and you know even if you pay way more for the wood up front if if it doesn't rot then maybe you just let it go natural style you know uh, uh, and I've got the wood downstairs that at some point I will be building a uh, um, like a lawn chair type rec- not recliner but like a uh, a laid out lawn chair 
and yeah. uh, uh, like a chase, I think they call it. But I've got it's white oak and western red cedar that it's going to be built out of. So I shouldn't okay. have to worry about that quite as much. So <laughs> oh, I mean that, that'll that'll last a long time. The problem is everyone wants it to have the original color over time. I know <laughs> that's not going to happen yeah, unless that, you finish it, right? Yep. <laughs> so you you finish it, you got that beautiful red color from the cedar, and it, you know looks amazing. But within Within six months, it'll start to already break down a bit and turn kind of half gray, and then a year later, it's totally gray, and then in order to get the color totally back, you have to completely start over, so it's pretty hard to maintain that, you know? No, I know, but, yeah. Oh, someday I'll build it. <laughs> yeah. Speaking I mean, when, you know, like for me, uh, you know, I work so many long hours as it is all year round, I... And the one thing I can't stand is maintaining something, you know? Mm -hmm. like, I'd rather put 40 hours into building something new and creating something beautiful rather than, you know, oh, I uh, I fixed my shed, I re-shingled this, and I uh, shoveled some snow. Like, all of that to me is <laughs> kind of wasted time. <laughs> so, <Yep. laughs> you know, anyways, I try to... You know, I try to, uh, like, slowly on our home, uh, you know, switch to all kinds of vinyl products and stuff, which <laughs> sounds bizarre when you know that I love wood so much, but there there are limits, so. Yeah, yeah, we're we're thinking of doing the siding different than it is on our house soon, too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, wood wood's beautiful, but in certain kinds of applications, it sometimes doesn't make sense. Mm-hmm. One and like like you were saying, outdoor stuff is is one of them things. Either buy something that doesn't rot and get used to the color gray, or yes. get used to f main maintenance. <laughs> yeah, like I remember, you know, I remember even uh, I think it was fine woodworking years ago. They did some testing on all the different, you know, some of the main brands of finishes that uh, advertise that they can withstand severe conditions outside mm -hmm. and. They finished all these different panels, and I think they sent them to different uh, authors for their magazine that lived in, like, the four different corners of the United States. Oh. So they had some up in, or some maybe down in Arizona, and some up in maybe, uh, you know, Connecticut where they had offices, mm -hmm. maybe some out in Seattle, all that kind of thing. And based on their testing, it was something like... Uh, like none of them <laughs> lasted more than a year, <laughs> and and the one the one that lasted best required something like seven to nine coats or some crazy amount that oh, the wow. manufacturer said you have to do this otherwise, otherwise it, uh, it's not guaranteed to work right. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so when you see it, you see a test like that, and you're like, wow, like really this stuff doesn't work that that well. Oh, so no. <laughs> it just uh, it's, it's not good if you have. It's good if you're just finishing something and then selling it to someone. <laughs> <laughs> you're not, They're not going to see it again for a while. <laughs> yeah. When it's in your own house, it's like, well, maybe maybe we've got to do something else here. Uh, that's about right. <laughs> yeah. Sure. So, and uh, anyways, before I went out to Houston, I also um, I also just finished before I left uh, restoring a nice little uh, Art Deco table. Um, your listeners, if they want to see a picture of, of what it looked like when it was done, they could go to my website and under the gallery of work it's called, there's a little subsection called Antique Restoration. And if they click on that, they'll see the picture at the top of the page. Oh, cool. And uh, yep. Hendrick, your website is passionforwood.com, right? Right. Yep. yep. Just to make sure, I mean, I... Um, hopefully I'll hit the, the right section where I put the website address in, but just in case I don't, it's so everybody knows that passionforwood.com and then uh, then follow what Hendrick said there, and I will have to go check that out too, actually. <laughs> yeah, so, yeah, I got that out. You know, a customer picked it up a couple of days before I had to leave, and then I was gone for almost two weeks, and, and you know how it is. You come back, you got a couple million emails piled up. Yeah. <laughs> and mail too, and it takes me at least a day and a half, two days, just to get through some of that stuff. Mm -hmm. And then I thought that was a good time to get a new computer, since my old one was about seven years old. And you know, every time I get a new computer, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm like, oh, hopefully they'll just transfer everything for me. I'll just plug it in, turn it on, and everything's just like it was. <laughs> it just never happens. Be being in IT. <laughs> Yeah, that ain't, that ain't gonna work. <laughs> no, like, I spent the last two days just trying to reload different programs and download stuff, and 
And then uh, this morning I got a message on the screen saying, you know, hard drive is failing. Back up everything quick. Oh, oh. <laughs> so off I go back to the back to the place where I got it for the second time in like two days. And here, fix this thing. Like it's brand new. Why why would the hard drive be failing already? Well, I don't know. <laughs> to put a used one in there or what? <laughs> Yeah. So, anyway, when when you look at the IT side of stuff, there's so many things that can go wrong in a computer. I am I understand all too well. <laughs> yeah, it's really frustrating, especially when you're not, you know, really into that kind of electronic stuff and mm -hmm. you don't understand it all. And it's just like, how can you spend so many hours just getting this thing up and running? You know. Well, and that's that's I uh well, obviously I, I I do IT for a living and and. There are so many little things, and and that's why I'm so happy that there's no computers in the shop. <laughs> yeah. Well, even uh, I remember years ago when I got a new table saw. You know, everybody thinks you're just gonna, you know, buy the saw and a couple of days later off you go. You're, you're, everything's good. But what they forget is that you've got like crosscut sleds and all kinds of different jigs that you've built over the years for your old table saw. Yep. <laughs> and and they're not gonna fit the new one. Uh huh. <laughs> so I had I had my new saw delivered on a Monday. I had a buyer already agreed to buy the old one, but I told them you can't have it till I know the new one's up and running perfectly. <laughs> and I think I took something like four days off work total to build you know, to set up the saw exactly the way I like, to build new jigs and and get the new, you know, the buyer of the old saw to come pick it up, and it's not, it's not something you just do in a half a day or something. No, not really. Jeez. Yeah, it takes, yeah. it takes a little while. So, yeah, I, I actually remember when, uh, when I went from the little Craftsman table saw that I had, and I actually had quite a few little, like you said, I had a sled that I built because it was safer, and, and quite a few jigs for doing things, and then I went to the big Steel City saw that I have now, and I'm like, well, it, it's great, but. I can make straight cuts, and that's about it. <laughs> You're lucky it could do that, eh? Yeah, I'm like, okay, yeah, it didn't take me long to get it, you know, all trued up and working good, but then, then it was like, oh, I don't have this, and I don't have that, and wow, i got to build a whole bunch of stuff yet. <laughs> yeah. That's that's one of the most frustrating things, I think, that a lot of my students uh, feel when they come to my shop, because... They're they're here for a course or or you know just come some local people just come in for half a day or one day at a time, and every time they say you know we figure out we got to do this thing, I'm like okay well I got a jig to do that you know I got a jig to taper legs I got a jig to cross cut I've got you know a nice miter gauge maybe that can cut 45 degrees exactly without even calibrating it, and you know every time I turn around I'm grabbing some new thing. And I I know that when they go home they're like I don't have that thing, <laughs> so they're either going out and coughing up another two grand on a bunch of little gizmos, yep. or or they're having to spend the next uh, you know several months of their free free time because they have a job probably doing something else. Yeah, uh, you know trying to build some of the jigs they've seen me use, and it really is really frustrating when you don't have that stuff already. Well, and it's it. it it takes a while. I mean, I know, you know, I started like a lot of people, you know, with a, with a real small um, table saw and, and more home improvement stuff. And, and the more I got into it, the more I wanted to do. But now that I have the shop downstairs, it, it's, I'm finally to the point where I don't have to go and, oh, I don't have that yet. Or, oh, I haven't built that. And it's so nice to feel like I can just go down there and build something instead of, Oh, uh, I don't have any of those things yet, so, or I've never yeah. put that together. <laughs> it took years to get there, but <laughs> yeah, oh yeah. Well, like I, you know, I've told people for the last several years that I actually I don't really have a list of things I need to buy anymore, like tools, right? Yeah, yeah. But it took. So, I mean, I've been doing this 17 years now, full time, uh -huh. and it it probably took about. 14 years to get to the point I could say I actually don't need anything else. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, there's still, you know, there's still things you open up a magazine or or see an ad somewhere and you're like, oh, that might be nice to have, but it's it's not sort of like I, I need to have it. I, I, I need it to do a job. Uh -huh. But most hobbyists don't get to the stage I would in 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 you know 14 years professionally they're not even going to get to that stage probably in 30 years of the hobbyist yeah yeah well in, in the unless they're quite wealthy and sometimes you know i do get customers who have 
a fair bit of disposable income, and they will just run out and buy tons of stuff at <laughs> once. But, but most people aren't in that position. So no, I I had the 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 fortunate um, timing of a lot of my stuff is I, I there's a, quite a few things that I prefer the older tools. So. Right. Somehow Craigslist has been very good to me, <laughs> um, but it, it, it like you were saying though it, it's really nice that I can finally go like into a Woodcraft or or a Rockler store, and there's mm-hmm. sp- something specific that I was there for you know, a, a a specific router bit because I I wanted to save time for something or or, or what what whatever it may be. Um, a new bandsaw blade or, or something like that that I was there for. And it's finally to the point where I'm walking around and it isn't, oh, well, this trip isn't going to cost me an extra $200 right. because I don't really need any of this. There's a few things I would like, but I don't need right. any of it. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I mean, when I, every time I go to a Lee Valley store, because, you know, they're in Canada here. Yeah. <laughs> um, I mean, you know, there used to be times where... You walk out with a, one little bag, and you could have six hundred dollars in there. <laughs> and that's one little, thing. <laughs> it's all it's all like rudder bits and yeah. drill bits. I mean, you know, they're they're expensive when they're good. So, mm-hmm. so yeah, I mean, uh, yeah, same thing. I can wander around Lee Valley, and you know, a few things look kind of interesting and might be nice to have, but it's it's not like oh god, I got to have this for the next job, mm-hmm. or I can't do it, right? Yeah, the uh, we we have a joke. I'm in a a, a woodworking club up in, uh, in in Green Bay, Wisconsin here, and um, every now and then they have either a twenty five or a fifty dollar gift card to the local woodcraft as part of our raffle prizes. Okay. So we all say yes. The one prize you can win that'll cost you at least a hundred dollars. Once you see all the other stuff, you yeah, know, you're right? like, well, I got this twenty five, but if I did that, <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, that's the way it is. Yeah. It's an expensive hobby. Uh, yeah, it happens to be that way. But it's at least it's rewarding when you're done with it. You you actually have something too. It's 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 fun. Oh. But yeah, this uh actually we were talking a little bit b- before the before we started recording and, and this one's kind of the I haven't been in the shop much at all because of because of all the things that have been going on out, out outside of my internet life and uh it's kind of one of them where even though I haven't been in the shop, you know, I've, it's kind of, you know, how do you keep in tune with, you know, the woodworking side of you, even though life got in the way? <laughs> and I mean, on on my end, it's, um, I have a, a woodworking club up in, up in Green Bay that I go to. So at least once a month, I, I took a, a couple hours and, and went and listened to a presenter there. And, and I was inspired that next year I want to take a class. There's a, a, a guy that does a, a sculpted, um, chair making. So it's basically, you, okay. you, know, you, you carve away and grind away a lot of this stuff and, and he's local. Yeah. So I'm like, you know what? that would actually be fun next year. And, mm-hmm. and, uh, you know, I read through a lot of blogs while I'm, you know, I have a, have a little time here and there and, and I have a subscription to way too many magazines. Um, <clears throat> so I, 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 I go through them and, and do several of those things. Uh, and then I attempted to do a little bit of carving and my, my gnome that I'm trying mm-hmm. to carve out of basswood. He looks like a gnome, although he does not yet have a face. <laughs> <laughs> Is he going to get one? Yeah, he'll get a face eventually, but I haven't gotten that far. I think the face is the part that scared me. I'm like, because if I screw that, he, he don't look like a gnome anymore. He'll look like a <laughs> goblin. <laughs> he might look like a friend of yours. Or <laughs> yeah, there's a couple that might be, oh, ew, i give that to somebody else. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So so what what um, I mean, what kind of things do you, I mean, obviously you you do it professionally, so you, you yeah. get. You're you're woodworking more than more than the average person that that's the hobbyist, obviously. Well, what kind yeah. of things might you think that people when when life gets in the way to keep you con- connected a little bit? I guess. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, you know, I like I personally feel that most of the students I work with, um, you know, I teach I teach women as well, but obviously more men in general mm-hmm. come in for courses, and it's amazing how many of them. Uh, are not any good at designing um, or you know they admit to me I'm not I'm just not good at that kind of stuff or you know I got to show my wife and she gives me input mm-hmm. and I like I personally feel like even though maybe in the summer you're busy you've got a lot of stuff to do and it's really not the right time of year to be in the shop 
um, you know, I see lots of opportunities to sort of turn your mind to design. And uh, like, like, let me give you an example. Sure. You know, in the, su- in the summertime, I, you know, we have a family camping trip every year. Mm-hmm. And there's another long weekend when I go camping with a couple of buddies of mine. And, you know, st- stuff like that where you're just sitting around the campsite, nothing to do but cook and eat and have a few drinks mm-hmm. and relax on the beach. <laughs> And, you know, to me, those are kind of opportunities to think more about design and sketch, you know. Oh, sure. And, you know, we'll go into town to uh, do some groceries, and there's, like, maybe some small antique shops and stuff, and I'll pop in there and and look around at pieces of furniture to see how they're built, you know. Yeah. Like, when I started out, even professionally, but, you know, a lot greener than I am now, I mean, I would make a habit of running into furniture stores constantly and just walking around just to see uh, how certain things are built or how, you know, how do you, how is, how is a drawer built? How is, uh, how do the different rails join to the sides of this bookcase or whatever? Mm-hmm. So um, I think, I think too many woodworkers, you know, put so much into learning techniques and, you know, how to set up their table saw and how to, sharpened hand planes and all this detail, Mm -hmm. but not enough time sort of looking at the grand scheme of things and, you know, what do I want to build and why and uh, getting some books on design and and learning different styles of design. Sure. So, you know, and and those are, like, those are the kinds of things that are more reflective and it's kind of hard to say, okay, I'm going to do that now for the next half hour. It's (laughs) got to be... It's got to be something you do when you're just chilling out on a beach or you're just chilled out at the picnic table at the campground. Or, you know, like when I went to Houston, I'm I'm sitting on a small plane that doesn't even have a television, right, or music or anything. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. those are those are times where you could have a sketch pad and, and you know, you've got three and a half hours to kill or whatever. Yeah. Uh, or you're going, you know, you're going on a cruise and you've got this long flight to get there and then you're going to be just sitting around doing nothing and waiting in lines and stuff like that. <laughs> yeah. so, you know, I really think in the summertime, like here in Canada, or at least in the cold parts of Canada, which is most of it, <laughs> um, you know, with all the woodworkers that don't want to be in the shop in the heat of the summer, um, they might be not really realizing how much, uh, how many opportunities they have in the summer to just lounge around and kind of let their mind go free and, and turn their mind to design more. Yeah, you know? sure. Yeah. That's how I, because really, you know, that's where the, like the techniques are, there's tons of techniques to learn and, you know, that probably almost never ends. But mm-hmm. um, but in terms of design and reading magazines, reading books, and, you know, people nowadays can just sit on their deck with a laptop and surf the internet. Yeah. Um, read the blogs, read the different websites out there. You know, it's all it's all good stuff to do when you, you kind of have the downtime. Yeah, yeah. And I, like you were saying, I've I've caught myself. You know, okay, I you know do a little sketch or something on a you know when I'm in in between meetings or, or when I have a little downtime before bed or you know hey, what about this kind of thing? And then then I'm figuring out how okay, well that would work. You know, the basic just little drawing of it. Now, how would I actually build that part? <laughs> exactly. Now, how is that going to go together? And then you think about it, and then you think about, no, that's not, that's, you're going to sit on that, and that's a fall part. <laughs> okay, redesign that part. <laughs> yeah, you have to, um, I don't know, the whole design process is interesting because it's it's a combination of, you know, you've got an idea of something you want to build. You kind of know what it is, and, but you have to analyze. Well, what is it for? What you know is it going to have to hold a certain amount of weight? Mm-hmm. Are you going to store certain things in it? So you got all those practical stuff, uh, and then you've got um, you've got the actual design. And then in the back of my mind is always, what tooling do I own, and what skills do I have already? Oh yeah, yeah. Because yeah. you know it's it's nice to push yourself into new areas too that you haven't done before. Mm-hmm. But you can't push yourself in giant leaps because then you'll fail and just give up, right? Yeah. So I, when I'm designing something, I'm I'm thinking, well, I've got these options. I've got, you know, mortise and tenon joinery, or I could do dowels, or I could do, um, you know, people do biscuits or dominoes or mm-hmm. rabbits and dados and all these different choices. And 
I'm always thinking, well, what can I do with the tools I already own and what things have I already done in the past so I know it's going to succeed? And then you got to compare that to you know, the needs of the project and how strong it has to be. So these are all things that really those kinds of thoughts and, and sort of an, uh, having the time to analyze that stuff. Like you, you really need to do that in a in a certain state of mind where time is not important at all, where yeah. you're just lounging around, you know? Yeah, where well, you're not trying to, i got to get this done. It's more of a, how would I do it? What is it? <laughs> yeah, being, at, you know, being at a cottage or being uh, out camping and stuff like that, it's the perfect time to grab a few magazines with you or a couple, couple good design books and, mm. you know, talk to your wife or whoever's with you about ideas and thoughts and, and bounce ideas off them, maybe let them drive for a change so you can think these things through in the passenger seat. Right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. <laughs> so, um, so anyway, that, that, that's, that's how I see, uh, you know, because I, I, I know when it's uh, when it's 90 to 100 degrees, even up here near Toronto in the summer, most woodworkers... Um, I mean, they might have an indoor shop where where it isn't too brutally hot, but they, you know, between cutting lawns and taking care of gardens and and cottaging and visiting with friends and all that, they really don't want to be in the shop for hours. But they, they still have lots of opportunities to plan and sort of, uh, you know, think ahead and plan what you're going to start doing after Labor Day. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. Once it's once the humidity goes away. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I mean that's that's the way I see it. Like right now, it's funny because. Uh, the last couple, well, maybe three, four weeks, I've uh, seen a little jump in my DVD sales in Australia. Mm-hmm. Oh. And I'm thinking, what's going on here? And <laughs> I have this customer in Australia, a regular guy, and I emailed him, and he said, oh, people are uh, getting back in the shop down here because it's winter. Right? Oh, yeah. <laughs> and I'm not even thinking that way. I'm always thinking summer is the slow time. <laughs> but, you know, on the other side of the world, they're getting back into their shops. So. See, it's good to be worldwide. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's interesting. That's cool. Well, speaking, speaking of DVDs, um, we can uh i guess we can give people a little a little bit of a teaser you got to, you got to, when when are some of your we're we're not talking about what they are they have to wait and find out yeah. but uh when are when are some of yours coming out a couple new ones right yeah i don't want to spill the beans on the topics till they're up on the website and it's official but mm-hmm. uh yeah i've got 10 titles so far and i've got another pair coming out probably in the next 4 to 6 weeks is the plan cool well and so i used to I usually release them right around Labor Day or just after, but it might even be a bit earlier this year. So oh, there we go. So yeah, once uh, once they come out, we can uh, you know maybe in the next show we could give out a copy of each and and talk a bit about the topics and stuff. Yeah, and uh, I know I know I like watching them, so I, I'm sure people will be uh, be looking for. Come on back, and we'll give you a chance to get a hold of some of them, <laughs> get some more information yeah. on what's coming out too. So we'll we'll make them wait until then. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm always so glad to finally get them out to market because there's so many months of uh, production time on the whole thing, like mm-hmm. planning and videoing and and the editing is like hundreds of hours. And when it comes out, it's like you know, I don't even want to look at it anymore. <laughs> I, just, I just want to sell it, but I don't want to look at it because I've seen every second of the footage so many times. It's, it's just exhausting, right? When the, the, I know the amount of time even just, you know, my minor little videos take to, to put together. And I'm like, you know, if something, you know, anywhere from five to 45 minutes to maybe an hour long that I'm just putting pictures to sound here and there right. takes, I can, can't can even imagine the amount of time somebody like you takes to do those videos. I'm like, holy cow. <laughs> and the detail. It's a lot of work and I've got, you know, I'm hiring people too to do the video work and the oh, editing yeah, work yeah. too. Yeah, so between still, between several of us, it's still a massive job. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, th- and this year was kind of, kind of worse because, um, you know, one of my main editors, um, she, you know, she's kind of, kind of finding it too too much work sometimes in a in a shorter block of time and trying to get tons of editing done over the summer months and she's trying to, you know, take some time off with her family and everything. Um, so this year, for the first time, I agreed to to move the production way earlier, like in terms of filming. Oh sure. <clears throat> 
just so that she could have like double the normal length of time to do the editing. So that you know that that worked out well, but mm-hmm. it meant that I it meant that I basically jumped into the next pair of productions almost immediately after getting the last two out to market. <laughs> and you know I wasn't in the mood to that soon. It's hard to it's hard to like want to jump back in so quick. You yeah. know? So even now I get people emailing me who buy them saying, you know, when are you coming out with the next one? And they're, they're like so anxious they want more. And I'm like. <laughs> Maybe two a year. Like it's not going to be every month. It's impossible. <laughs> well, so. the, the demand is a good thing. <laughs> oh yeah, it is. It is. But uh, yeah, you can only do so much, and it's you know it's only one one piece of my business. So you got to keep everything else rolling too. Oh yeah, yeah. Yeah. So how is um how's uh how's the, the classes going? Uh, I, I'm I'm sure being back from Texas, you you probably um I guess you yeah. We're down there, so your classes were down there for a while. But yep. You have uh, you have other stuff uh, uh, coming up, and well, actually, um, like I do private instruction all year round. Mm-hmm. You know where people come in here just one on one. So yeah, so I got people coming and going. Uh, I know in mid August I've got a another four day um, time period. I'm traveling actually to someone's cottage about I think a four and a half hour drive away to. Um, set up machinery for them okay oh, cool. so this is someone who came here for a course earlier this year for a week and as a result of the course he bought a whole bunch of equipment and um, you know he just said like let's plan way ahead and I, I want you to come down and go through every single machine and fine-tune them and teach me how to maintain them and and that kind of stuff so I got another little assignment there oh, cool that the and, one-on-one instruction like that has got to be you know go, going from you know, trial and error when I didn't know what I was doing at all to, to finally learning it and picking it up along the way and, and going to different people. But having that one-on-one has just got to be so valuable. <laughs> and I mean, even for me, as, you know, the instructor, it's it's amazing how much I learn along the way. Mm-hmm. Because, you know, I've got certain machines in my shop, but then I go on site to someone else's and I've got different machines and different brands and it's kind of a learning thing for me too to suddenly, you know, set up a different machine I've never worked on before. Because it's you know, usually they're similar enough that I'm, you know, I'm not lost. I know what I'm doing, but sure. but but there's still some differences. Like, for example, down in Houston, I I set up somebody's uh, uh, jointer, and the beds were not coplanar, and mm-hmm. so I spent a couple hours getting that sorted out. And it just so happens that's the exact same joiner the person up here at this cottage hat just bought. Well, so, there you go. <laughs> that so when I walk in there, like I've already know exactly what the issues are going to be and what kind of tools we need to have because, you know, because the manufacturer put a bolt somewhere where it's almost impossible to get to that kind of stuff. That's always fun. Who who engineers some of this stuff? <laughs> so, yeah, some of it uh, is not thought through that far. Yeah. And and then there was another another person in Houston. I was at his shop, and he wanted to change the. Uh, he has a 15 inch, uh, you know, stationary planer. Oh, nice! And and the oil has been dripping out of the gearbox for like two years, and they just kind of put a towel under it. Oh no! <laughs> <laughs> just kind of ignored it, and he's too scared to try and fix it. So, while I was down there, you know, he bought a couple of gaskets in advance, and I. It took that part of the machine apart and, and replaced it, and that was something I'd never done before. But just looking at the schematic drawing, it wasn't that complicated, and mm-hmm. you know, and got it done. So, so I'm I'm learning along the way too. And yeah. you know, a year later, someone else needs something like I just did a year ago, and it's still fresh in your mind, and yeah. you just keep expanding your knowledge, right? Yeah, yeah, that's cool. So, it's good stuff. That's, that's kind of like we do when we work with the computer stuff, because every once in a while you run into something, you're like, what in the... Oh, this uh-huh. is new. Cool. <laughs> yeah, you can't know all of it, but slowly, you, you know, the more more time you do it and more opportunities come up to learn new stuff yourself. So. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it's all good. Well, cool. Yeah, so, uh, yeah, and then the other thing, you know, I do these seminars on Saturday mornings, but... Uh, like in small groups, but that's something that I always, uh, you know, years ago I discovered that people just aren't going to come to those in the summer when they're busy with with holidays and stuff. So yeah, they start up right after Labor Day every year, and I wind them up around uh, the very start of June. So oh, that's cool. So that's actually been nice to have uh, about three months 
where I don't have that, you know, I still have private students and doing my own woodworking too, but, but, you know, when you're doing two or three seminars per month for months on end, it, it, it does kind of grind you down a bit and you kind of look forward to having a bit of a break like a school teacher would, you know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so that's cool. been nice to, to not have to be on that treadmill getting ready every late Friday night, setting up the shop, bringing out the chairs, and, yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah. a certain routine. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. And then the it's weird. Making the 6.30 a.m. donut run to the coffee shop. <laughs> yeah. It's weird when, you, when you're when you done with that run of stuff, it's got to be, oh, good, I get a break from it. But when you start it up again, it's like, oh, here we go. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah it, I mean, it is fun, but everybody needs a break, and... Mm. You know that's what I've always enjoyed about my business is that it's it's quite varied between many different things that I do, like all woodworking related, but still very different kinds of things from teaching to doing to DVD production and everything else. So um, you know, it sort of keeps it interesting. I can't imagine just doing one thing like you know some people might just build uh, Adirondack chairs mm -hmm. like thousands of them per year and it's only three different designs all year long yeah i just can't imagine doing that kind of that kind of work you know i just i don't like think i would up. i don't think i would like it very much either but i think it's good there's some people that do <laughs> yeah i mean there's millions of factory workers out there and that's kind of what they do in mm -hmm. the factory and very routine stuff and you know as long as they got a good job they're happy yeah but, uh, but once you get a taste of something like running your own business and you do so many different things, it's kind of hard to think about going back to work for someone else and and maybe having a, a more routine job that's the same every day. You know. Yeah, my my wife uh, my wife has her own business and and there's there's days that I think it could just go away for her, but then there's other days where it's like there's no way I'd want to not. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So. Yeah, there's good and bad. That's for sure. Oh yeah. <laughs> And, you know, actually, another thing I've been busy with um, lately, you know, we talked one time about the whole cooking thing. Yeah, how's that going? Yeah, well, it's been going okay, but uh, a couple months ago, you know, I thought, <clears throat> out of all the people that I teach in woodworking, and I, you know, notified everyone of what I'm doing with cooking, mm -hmm. um, you know, there's still only a small proportion of them interested in cooking, because these are all woodworkers, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so I thought, I thought, gee, I really have to get out there and meet more people who are into food and cooking, mm -hmm. completely separate from woodworking. Yeah. So I decided to um, look into some cooking schools and, and see if anyone would hire me to teach classes. Yeah even though I'm not uh, an officially trained chef, you know, it, it makes it tougher, I think. Yeah. <laughs> but but anyways, I, I interviewed and um, had to do some auditioning with with two big grocery store chains that run woodworking schools, and both of them have hired me to do some classes. So, oh. so I just did, like, one of the chains is a huge national company, and um, I just did two classes for them in the last month, and I got another one scheduled in August. And and now they've after you know auditioning for them a couple of times they they've decided I'm good enough to <laughs> to uh, send my name to about five other stores in you know in the I only want to go so far maybe an hour drive right from yeah. where I am yeah. and then and then the other chain they've hired me already to do six uh, evening cooking classes in the fall at six different stores so nice. Um, so that's kind of been in the background and, and, you know, they send me, sometimes you get to cook your own recipes. Other times they're giving you a recipe they want you to cook because they're trying to promote certain products. Yeah. So that's been challenging for me to test the recipes and do the seminars. And then, um, you know, when I was down in Houston, I cooked dinner for one of my clients for him and his wife. And, and so I just kind of got the cooking and the woodworking all mixed together, but <laughs> Cool. People like fun. Cool. And when I go, you know, when I go camping, for sure I'm going to be <laughs> cooking up a storm every day because that's <laughs> what I love to do when I got time off, and and it all kind of goes together well. So nice. Well, that's cool. Try good to, to good to hear that. Week. Still moving along too. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, that's that. It's actually been very rewarding, but also, uh, you know, because I'm not a trained chef, you kind of 
wonder how people are going to accept you in a, in a new area. Yeah. And you well, know, so for me, for me to do an audition where a trained chef is watching me and marking me, like like critiquing me and uh-huh. and saying and saying yes, I do think you're good enough to do more classes at more stores. So it's sort of validating that you know That's, maybe you're not totally at the lunch. That'd be a good <laughs> feeling too. <laughs> yeah. Well, I know yeah, so. I know my grandmother was not a trained chef. But she could make some damn good food. <laughs> yeah. I mean, the, the the hardest thing for me, it's not the cooking itself, and it's not even the, um, you know, I've been teaching for so long and doing seminars, that, like I'm not afraid of speaking in public and mm-hmm. any of that stuff. But the hardest thing is the volume, because, for example, one of the uh, classes is like, it's only a one hour of prep time, and it's only a one hour class, and in that, that hour of class time, you're cooking the whole thing oh, wow. and serving it, and they have to eat it all within the hour, Oof. and there's like 32 people that you're serving. Oh, my. <laughs> so that's not normal for me to have to cook for 32 people over the course of like one hour of class time and one hour of prep time. You know. <laughs> like, I, I, you know, a trained chef who's worked in restaurants all their life, they would just be like, what's the big deal? 32 people is nothing, right? Yeah. We normally do 500 in a night. <laughs> whereas, whereas for me, you know, you're used to cooking for maybe 12 people at Christmas at most. <laughs> and suddenly 32 people is looking kind of intimidating. But uh, my, my cooking for 32 people would be either we're buying a lot of burgers and brats to put on the grill <laughs> yeah. or we're yeah. ordering a lot of pizza. <laughs> <laughs> that reminds me of one of my other uh, clients down in Houston, and his wife said, "Oh, you know what I really like to make?" I said, "What?" She said, "My favorite thing to make are reservations." Yeah, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> She's not into the cooking. So. Ever- anyway, so lots of stuff has been uh, keeping me hopping, woodworking and cooking and eating too. So yeah, cool. Got to watch the weight now. <laughs> yeah, that's that's. <laughs> That's why I like the eating portion, and that's why I got to do my my long bike rides on the weekends in the summer. So kind of when I pack it on in the winter, I take it off in the summer. You know. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I was you know talking to my kids about our camping trip coming up, and and you know, I mean they love swimming and they love so many things. But one of the big things is they're listening to me every meal I've ever made that they love, and they're they're like <laughs> kind of give, giving me a menu, saying this is what we want <laughs> this week. We want. We want those chicken wings again, and we want that pasta you made, and they're giving me the whole list. Right? <laughs> so when, when we go camping, you know, I pretty much take over all the grocery shopping, all the cooking for the week, and you know, it's a great break for my wife because normally she does most of it around here, except on the week on the Sunday or something. Mm-hmm. Uh, so it gives her a break, and and you know, I love to do it too, and cool. I'm not I'm not the type to want to lay on the beach for six eight hours a day, so no. I'd rather stay busy doing some other things too. So. <laughs> cool. Well, it sounds like a fun time, man. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, well, we've been uh, we've been doing this. Uh, we did. We got to do this a little later since my uh, my work schedule had changed. So I'm I'm sure you've got a stuff that you got to get going and doing. And I have to find now talking about all this food. I got to go find me some supper. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So uh, within uh, within a month to two months, we'll be having another one with Hendrick here. We'll be scheduling that, and I'll uh, I'll put on the blog when this is come when the next one will be coming out with the show notes from this uh, on this episode. And uh, we'll be talking again soon, Hendrick. Thank you Good. for uh, for coming back, and hopefully we'll we'll keep it on a normal schedule again. <laughs> yeah, okay. yeah. My my new DVD should be out soon. So as soon as that happens, we'll let you know, and then we can. We can try to book a show and give away a couple of coffees. That sounds great. And I like giving stuff away. <laughs> yep. <laughs> All right. Okay. Well, good talking to you, Andrew. And thanks again. Okay. Take care. You too.